Welcome to Corporate Competitor Podcast. The premise of this show is to learn how sports shape today's business icons. But to celebrate Father's Day, we are rewinding back to an episode we recorded with Jack Nicholas and Jack Nicholas II when the book we wrote together first was released. Jack Nicholas, or the Golden Bear, as he is known to his many fans, is widely regarded as the greatest golfer of all time with a record 18 major championships. But his life and values show that his true legacy lives through his children and his grandchildren. As much as I appreciated the career and the reputation of that golden bear, listening to his son Jackie tell stories about him made him an even greater giant in my mind. In this episode, you will hear the story behind the most iconic moment at the 1986 Masters. Learn Jack's formula for a successful marriage and discover how to turn your passion into a mission. It is totally about spending time with dad. And, you know, he's loved in the game of golf and the game of sport. He's transcended sport. Jackie is who I had spent the week with, who I shared the tournament with, who had been my eyes and my support all week. I hear the crowd roaring and turning around expecting to see dad's back facing the crowd and uh, there's dad looking at me, making me a part of it. Dad made me feel like I counted. I felt like I was loved. Who could I share it better with than with my son? I cannot thank the both of you enough for giving time to share with us today. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure. So I want to start, Jackie, with the story that made me stop in my tracks. The first time you told me the story, I realized, wow, this is going to be an incredible experience. It also helped me think a little differently about my own role as father. Jackie, in this story, you're 18 years old. You're playing in the Palm Beach County Junior Golf Association Tournament. And while you were signing your scorecard, you were told your father was on the phone. Can you pick the story up from there for us? Oh, sure. It was uh, 1980. I'm a teenager all about me, me, me. I can't see past my own nose, like many teenagers out there. And I have five children, so I understand that a little bit. But uh, I'm signing my scorecard into what I'm doing, and I get a phone call from my father. Uh, Very embarrassed. I can remember being a little bit annoyed. What's dad calling me about right now? I'm doing something really important, signing a scorecard. He quickly asks me, uh, hey, how'd you do today? God bless daddy. Listen for about 15 minutes of me going on and on how I hit it right here, hit it left there, missed the putt here, hit it fat there. And after 15 minutes, I was about ready to get off the phone. And there's a little bit of a pause. And dad kind of meekly asked, well, do you want to know how your dad did today? Quickly came back to me that dad was playing in a tournament of his own. I said, of course, dad, how'd you do? He says, well, I won the U.S. Open today. (laughs) <laughs> it really put things uh, back to reality and in perspective for me. And as a teenager, it made me see a little bit past my own nose. Yeah. What he was doing at the time, even though, you know, looking at it back today, it was infinitely more important what dad had just accomplished that day, winning the open of Baltusrol. Dad listened to me. It was a big wake up call as a teenager. Uh, Jack, what do you remember? Do you remember that exchange, that phone call? Do I remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember it was a little comical, but it was okay. It was fun. I was really was interested in what he did. I knew that he was playing a tournament. It was an important tournament to him. And I wanted to hear how he did. And then we got done with it. And, you know, Jackie had been interested only in what he was telling me about his golf tournament. And I finally just said, I wonder what your dad did. (laughs) What a great lesson. And obviously stuck with him for all these years because you've heard him tell the story, but it's so impactful. And Jackie... What did you learn from your dad that day that you used in your role? You mentioned five children as parent. Well, as a father, I'll be the first to admit, I'm always going to be a father in learning. I'll never uh, suggest that I know a whole lot about parenthood, only what I've learned as I live. And I'm learning every day. But uh, that was a big lesson for me that I try to apply to how I raise my kids. I try to listen to them. Jack. Your father set a really high bar for you. I've heard you talk about him. And when you do, your eyes moisten a little bit as you talk about all that he taught you because you're so grateful. What lesson might you share with us that you learned from your father that stands out with you? 
my dad was not interested in anything that he did. He was interested in only what I did. You know, he was wrapped up in my football, basketball, baseball, tennis, golf, whatever it might be. That was always his first subject of conversation. And he participated in all those sports with me. He was a good athlete. And he enjoyed being part of my life. And I've always enjoyed being part of my kids' lives. You know, I got my kids and I got 22 grandkids. So I've enjoyed being part of their lives too. And we're trying to keep it be part of, I mean, when I take the grandkids to the Masters to caddy for me at the Par 3 tournament, I remember taking Nick up there. And Nick, you know, the football player at Florida State, you know, pretty big deal in his own right. He goes up there and looks at him and says, hey, man. He's a big deal up here, isn't he? <laughs> Nick never had any idea, which is okay. I didn't want him to have any idea that I was some kind of a special cat or anything. I'm more interested in what they want to know. I want them to understand the experience, of what I went through, what their grandfather did. And the same with my kids all the way through. Jackie's done that very, very well with his kids. Yeah. No, it's been neat to watch the family dynamic and to get a chance to watch how you have shared this through generations. You know, Jackie, you had the privilege of giving a speech in Washington, D.C. It's on the internet. Anybody that wants to watch it could snap on over there to it. Your father was receiving the Congressional Gold Medal. And your speech was touching and reflective of not only how great of a golfer he was, but how great of a human he is, and that you take great pride in that legacy. Tell me about the honor of that moment, to be able to introduce your dad while he was awarded that highest civilian honor of being presented by Congress? Well, I remember when dad first asked me if I would be one of the presenters at the Congressional Gold Medal. I knew dad had presented for Arnold Palmer, and I got very nervous, didn't think that I would be worthy enough to do something like that. So I immediately suggested, why don't you ask one of your contemporaries, maybe like a Tom Watson, a dear friend of our family, or you know someone along those lines. And Dad kind of smiled at me and he said, well, consider a practice run for my eulogy. <laughs> that really, really helps, Dad. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, did say that? You did say that. And uh, I don't know how far in advance it was, but I spent so much time. Uh, I actually went to Scott Pauley and I said, Scott, who uh, helps Dad with a lot of his speech, I said, will you help me with this? He said, absolutely not. You're on your own. So I wrote and I wrote and thank goodness Scott put me on that assignment because I think uh, my heart really came out in my words. You want to talk about an intimidating arena. We're in the rotunda at the Capitol there and many of our government leaders and uh, a huge crowd was there. And I was able, I think, to share some pretty special memories of my relationship with dad and the man that I've watched for so many years. During the speech, you noted that the question you get most in life is, what is it like to be Jack Nicholas's son? The answer you gave then was extraordinarily powerful. I've watched it over and over again because I thought it was so amazing. And what a great story. I am asked that question a lot. And it's always been a very difficult question to respond to because, again, I have nothing to compare it to. I know dad is dad and mom is mom. And they've been amazing role models and examples for how I think someone should live a life. Well, I started thinking about it when I was going to present dad at the rotunda and I kind of felt like the best way to describe it was what I felt and experienced in 1986. You know, I was able to caddy for dad. He shared a great walk with me around Augusta National uh, when dad won his sixth jacket. So I'm caddying for him and I watched dad. I watched the emotions as he walked up each green and tee and how the people you know, applauded him so much and they applauded him for not just what he was doing that day, but the man that he's been throughout his life, what he stood for throughout his life. And um, they love him. You know, he's loved in the game of golf and the game of sport. And he's transcended sport. Fast forward after an amazing afternoon caddying for dad, we're on the 18th green. We didn't know at the time that he had won the tournament, but he had given it every chance to win. Uh, Tom Kite and Seve Ballesteros and Greg Norman still to finish up, but dad had given it everything he could. He taps in for a short par putt at 18 to complete a 65. He's, uh, I hear the crowd roaring. I'm putting the flag into the cup and turning around, expecting to see dad's back facing the crowd and, uh, you know, receiving the accolations that he so deserves. And there's dad looking at me, making me a part of it. You know, dad made me feel like I counted. 
And mostly I felt like I was loved. And that's what it's like to be Jack Nicholas's son. I have to tell you, I've um, I've heard you tell that story a bunch of times. I get like emotionally caught up in it each time. Jack, as Jackie said, you could have easily turned and acknowledged the crowd, but you turned back to Jackie. What a great lesson for all of us. What do you remember about that moment? Well, I remember that I got into the clubhouse and finished with a 65. I put rolls another three inches. I'm 64. That would have put me in a, probably an uncatchable position, but it didn't. We had to wait. But as soon as I hold the putt out, you know, Jackie is who I had spent the week with, who I shared the tournament with, who had been my eyes and my support all week. It was my turn to say thank you for being my support, being with me and being part of it. And who could I share it better with than with my son? That was very special to me. What a neat and emotional moment. You know, Jack, in the book, there's a portion that Jackie talks about how your wife, Barbara, and you were pretty open with your children about the formula for a successful marriage. This idea that it's not 50-50, as some people want to think, that to really be successful and to celebrate, as you have more than six decades of marriage, pretty incredible, you have to be willing to give far more than you expect. Can you share a little of that formula and how it's adjusted over time? I think that the end formula is probably about 95% give and about 5% take on both sides. You know, you learn to live with each other. You learn to live as a person. You learn to support. Most of my life, Barbara supported me. No matter what I did, she knew I didn't need the confrontation. She knew that when I went to the golf tournament that I needed support behind me, not worrying about what was going on at home. So her problems are my problems if we had any. She kept them to herself. As a result, I was free to go ahead and play. And then about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, maybe, the Honda tournament came to our area. Barbara really, we both were big in children's care, but Barbara really big in children's care. And of course, the tour has always been big on charity, but not to the extent that it is today. And so when we ended up forming our foundation, now this was her thing, and it's my turn to support her. It was a reversal of positions. Percentages. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm sitting there going from a golfer to a, a support of my wife's foundation. Frankly, I've had more fun doing that, seeing what's happening with these kids. The result of some of the things that have happened is because through our efforts is far more important than any four-foot putt that I ever made. Yeah. It's the truth. I mean, you see one of these little kids that just were never going to make it in life, and are going to make it because of my wife's efforts and my support and the thousands of people who have helped us get there, we've touched many, many, many lives. You know, Jackie and I were talking the other day and he was telling me a story. He's watched you beam a few times in your life, very proud, very excited about things that have happened, but nothing, he hadn't seen a bigger smile on your face than when you were standing behind Barbara as she was talking at an event related to the Honda charity and the work that was being done. He just said, you know, if you want to look at a model and how to love each other and support each other, watching you beam behind her was extraordinary. Well, you know, that's part of what it is. You know, it's like Jackie behind me at the Masters. and My kids have all been that way. Barbara's that way. And I've tried to return it. It's probably been the uh, secret to our marriage. I love it. Well. It's a secret we now are glad to to learn because uh, we could all work from it. You know, Jackie, I had the blessing recently to have had dinner with you and your wife, uh, our families, and it happened to be the week that your dad had just read an excerpt of your book in a golf magazine. And you were sharing with me that he called you and you asked your dad, what did you think when he read the excerpt? Well, you know, my dad's approval to me has always meant so much to me. You know, most everything I've done in life has been to try to catch his eye and get dad's approval. And he had read that excerpt that was in the magazine that you referred to and I happened to talk to dad. I said, dad, what'd you think? And, you know, he said, um, it brought a tear to my eye and I'm really proud. Mm-hmm. I mean, what else, uh, what else could I hope for, you know? Yeah. I mean, it is true, Jackie, every one of us, seeks that approval. We want to hear those words. I'm proud of you. And Jack, that means a lot that you said them to him. And I watched him that night as he shared them. And it was really, it was evident that your approval and your encouragement meant so much. 
You know, Jackie, after all this time now being proud of your dad, how are you sharing your pride in your children? As I mentioned earlier, mom and dad have been my role models, way to live a life, way to parent. And I've tried to mirror with my children as I've experienced being a son of my mom and dad. So proud of my kids. You know, I made mistakes. My kids have made mistakes and will make mistakes, but they seem to make really good choices in life to date. And I think that I've helped form a good foundation for them. I also will say that mom and dad as grandparents have helped create a great foundation for them. You know, the last chapter, Don, you said that through this book, something would happen that really touched me. And Don, I can remember the question you asked me, you said, you know, please describe the relationship you share with your kids. And I quickly started to respond. And all of a sudden I stopped. I said, this, this doesn't, you know, there's more than just a quick response here. I need to think about this. And I went home that afternoon. We were up in Tallahassee and I, you know, I said, you know what, rather than me explain the type of relationship that I share with my children, I reached out to each of my five children. I asked them to give me a quick summary of what they felt our relationship was. And I don't know that I've been as touched from their responses as I have anything that I've ever received from my kids. And that's shared in our last chapter, Full Circle. And just, well, I hope everyone gets a chance to read that because uh, for them to describe that was amazing for me. But Jackie, you know what was so cool about that was I took that as a lesson. I mean, yes, it was a really neat piece of the book, but I actually went to my children and asked them to do the same. And I think that would be, if there's any takeaway from this book, I think if a parent were to actually go and ask a child, describe our relationship, put it in words, man, there's some incredible instruction for us in that. How cool that you did it. And I'm glad I I took your lead and did the same. Jack, we talked earlier about Jackie caddying for you in that 86 Masters, but he had caddied for you over a number of different years. There's an interesting backstory to how he became your caddy. But what was it like to share that period of your career with your very own son. I mean, that's obviously a unique experience. Most golfers don't have their son on the bag. What was it like to travel and experience that period of your career together? Oh, well, it was fun. I mean, it's always more fun to share something with one of your sons or your daughter than it is, you know, with somebody that's just on the outside. And of course, I always felt like the two best caddies I had when I played golf were Jack and Steve. They sort of alternated in a lot of events. And uh, I guess to see Jackie and I, we won a Memorial in 84 and the uh, Masters in 86. Is that the two? We <clears throat> and uh, the uh, Cherry Hills, the senior US oh, Open oh, yeah, as well. In, in 93. And came close, actually, the first time I caddy for you in 1976 by accident, actually, you finished second. At Burkdale, yeah. Yep, Royal Burkdale. And then Steve and I won at uh, Colonial in Fort Worth. So, you know, to share that with my boys is pretty special and to have them with me. I mean, I had a caddy named Angelo most of my life, and Angelo was a great guy, but Angelo didn't even play golf. I mean, he might break 90 if he, on his best day, and he didn't really know anything about anything other than what I asked him to do, but that was okay. That's what I wanted. Now, Jack and Steve are both good players. I pulled the clubs out of the bag, but still, I respected their decision on what they thought the shot might be because they were good players and could understand that. And as far as reading greens, the 71st hole at the Masters, Jack and I looked at this putt. I had about a, oh, I don't know, 12 foot putt, I suppose. I looked at it and I said, What do you think? And he says, I think it's going to go right. I think, I think it's going to go right too, but I think Ray's Creek, which was down to the left, I said, it's going to influence it. It'll pull it back. He says, Are you sure? I think so. <laughs> so I hit it and the ball goes up and you can just see in the putt. It just sort of edges its way back just a little bit, and it goes in. Now, I've putted that putt 100 times since. I haven't seen an edge back since. <laughs> but I, they changed the greens every year at Augusta, so I think it probably lost that feature in the green. But those are the kind of things that, you know, I wouldn't ask just anybody. I respected the decision of my son because it was as important to him, maybe even more so than to me. Yeah. He did not want to make a mistake trying to help me, give me something that I didn't want. That puts a lot more pressure on him. Yeah. 
you know, I think it worked out well and it was great. It was fun. You know, I wish I was still playing. I, I just love to still be out there competing and having Jack and Steve on the bag. You know, I've had some of the grandkids on at Augusta. They've been fun. No clue whatsoever about golf or what's going on, but, the, you know, they carry the bag and do fine. And, and we have fun together. It's fun. Spending time with your family. That's what it's all about, Doc. No question. It is totally about spending time with dad and to really think that an 86 or 24 year old kid would know more about the greens and than Jack Nicholas. I don't think that's the case. To confirm, my brother Steve and I never clubbed my dad except one time. I don't know if you, the story that I, that my brother Steve tells me. <laughs> what a great story. I think it was the British Open or maybe it was a. It was Atlanta. Was it Atlanta? Yeah. Yeah, we got to the 18th hole. And Steve was always one never to carry any more in the bag that he had. So he put three balls in the bag when we started. That's it. He would usually have a dozen golf balls. He only had three because Steve lightened the bag. He lightened the bag. He didn't want to carry all that <laughs> bag. He said, I need all those balls. Got to the 18th hole in Atlanta, and I uh, cut two balls and took them out of play early in the round. And I was in the fairway in the last hole, and I had, whether it's a three-wood to the green or layup with about a four or five iron. And Steve says, I think you better lay up with a four or five iron. Why? I, I can get to the green. He said, no, I said, I think the right club is a four iron. <laughs> Steve, what are you talking about? He says, that's the only ball you got left. <laughs> 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 and so I hit the water and disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a nine ball lesson right there. Carry more. And he did take the three wood and Steve says his heart beat quickly because there was a little bit left of the pin and it settled between the green and the water caught up on the grass. And I think he got up and down for a birdie. Did I really? I and really then you said, don't ever do that to me again. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course I would say that. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, Jackie, your father's mentioned you were a pretty good golfer. What was it like to go from being the golfer to being the person as a teammate, if you will, almost a servant partner of your father. What was that transition like? Honestly, I didn't think much about it. I mean, I played a lot of competitive golf all my life. And I know that, that a caddy's out there more in a support role. Right. I understood the role that dad expected from his caddy. In 1976, my dad's official caddy, Jimmy Dickinson, tore his Achilles walking up to the ninth green on the official practice round over at Royal Burkdale. And I happened to be there. I was just watching dad in the practice round. He said, why don't you carry the bag for me on the uh, back nine? And I do remember just playing with Raymond Floyd in the practice round. Dad hit down the middle of the fairway with his drive, had a four iron approach to the tent hole at uh, Royal Burkdale. And I picked up the bag and just took off down the hole, really not thinking much about it. And dad goes, uh, are you forgetting something? What are you talking about, dad? He says, the divot. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I put the bag down. I fixed that divot better than anybody could ever fix a divot. And he never had to remind me to fix a divot after that, I promise you. But it was an easy transition because honestly, it was more father and son than it was competitor and caddy on the golf course. Always. That's awesome. You know, Jack, midway into your playing career, you added to your portfolio a company that would design golf courses. It's now legendary. Was there a philosophy about course design that you wanted to bring to the market? Is that why you entered the golf course design market? I got sort of enamored with it. I thought it was fun. All of a sudden finding that the way you play golf, you could express it on a piece of ground. And then you could take that piece of ground, you could use it as it was, or you could change it to make it fit what you wanted it to fit or how you think that the game should be played on that piece of ground. Jackie got involved at a very early age with that, in his teens somewhere. I don't know. I just I did it as sort of an avocation for probably more than 10 years. And finally, my CEO came to me. He said, Jack, don't you think it's about time you made your avocation a vocation? Everybody else is getting paid for what they do. You've done some really good golfers. Don't you think it's time that you did that? I said, well, I really hadn't even thought about it. I started doing that. And as a result, I've done over 300 golf courses. Jackie's been with me probably on close to 100 of them. And he's done over 50 on his own. And that's so incredible. It's been a great second life. Going to be here, somebody, as I say, it's going to be here beyond my golf game in my lifetime for people to enjoy or hate, I suppose, whichever they <laughs> wish to do. 
but it's been very rewarding. Jackie, your dad mentioned it. You joined the company and you are now actively engaged. So tell me, what did being a competitor teach you about golf course design? What did playing so well and then being with your father on so many incredible experiences teach you about what a, a great course could look like? Well, it really helps to understand how to play the game of golf. And at a higher level, I think it really helps when I'm trying to put something on a piece of property. Most everything I've learned in the design business has been from Pop, watching dad, seeing how he thinks things through. Uh, we've, I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with dad on several golf course properties. And funny, uh, I was asked a question early on, you and your father disagree on something. How do you end up with an end product? I said, well, dad expresses what he believes should happen on this piece of property. I will express how I believe what happens on this property. And then we do what dad wants to do on the property. <laughs> well, that was going to be my question. <laughs> That's not true, Don. It's not true? No, no, no. It's quite often. I ask his opinion. I want his opinion. He reviews his opinion quite often. Matter of fact, yesterday we were working on two different pieces of property on the west coast of Florida. The one golf course was uh, Twin Eagles, where Jackie was a lead on that. It was a uh, co-design. Uh, Back in 98, 99. 99, yeah. I saw the picture on the program, and Jackie, you like you were barely shaving back then. I, I saw that picture yesterday, and I said, what has happened? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we were on the golf course yesterday, and basically, co-design, I let Jackie take the lead. When it's a signature, I take the lead. I'll make the final decision when it's a signature, and I let him make the final decision when it's a co-design. We're there yesterday. And there are four or five holes that we did that I could have probably changed. And I didn't because I asked his opinion. He says, well, I want to do this. I said, okay. That was his opinion and he took the lead. So you've got to respect the lead of the deal. Pretty soon you end up with too many cooks in the deal and you end up with a bad product. But I don't want to end up with a bad product. And you want to be consistent with your product. You don't want to do something silly, totally different than something else during the middle of it. You want to flow. There's a rhythm to a golf course that people don't understand. I'm not sure that I understand it, but you try to make things work so that you go from one hole to the next, and it's a nice balance and feels comfortable for people playing it. You don't end up with three par threes in a row or three 480-yard par fours in a row. You get a balance in a golf course and you know, right to lefts and ups and downs and all kinds of things. So it's important that who's ever leading it leads it. And you know what, I might add to that, one of my bigger challenges or whatnot doing a golf course design, I think what I had to learn is how to accommodate the higher handicap or how to accommodate the member who you may have a tournament on that uh, one week a year, but uh, the rest of the year, your members or your public that's playing your golf course. So you've got to maybe reduce or eliminate force carries, allow a higher handicap or a way to get around the golf course and still come off that golf course with a smile. Both of us near and dear to our hearts, uh, Augusta National. I mean, that's a mecca to our family. And dad has commented, he thinks it's one of the greatest membership golf courses he's ever played. It's a golf course that you don't have to change to host a tournament. It's a great golf venue every day for the members. And when it's time to have a tournament there, they just pull the tees back to lengthen out the golf course, tuck the pins, maybe speed the greens up, and you're done. The mark of a great golf course. And it plays well for both the average golfer and the good player. I got in a lot of trouble years ago down at Royal Melbourne in Australia. It's, you know, they thought that golf course was absolutely the toughest golf course. When I said, I said, it's a wonderful members golf course. Oh, no, what do you mean it's a wonderful members golf course? It's, I said, well, that was a compliment because Royal Melbourne was much like Augusta National, both done by Alistair McKenzie. It's a wonderful golf course played by its members from their tees, just moving Tease back, hide the pins, and boom, you got a championship golf course. That's a mark of a good golfer. The thing that I see happen every day now, you have the U.S. Open at a golf course, and they change half the golf course to have the tournament. You don't have to do that. And in the process of doing that, obviously what you're saying is that you're not building a course that's good for all. And I, I love that. I mean, in fact, I live here in Tallahassee, as has been referenced, and you combine together to do – the first Jack Nicholas legacy golf course in North America, right here in Tallahassee. And Jackie takes the lead. You're working on it. 
But I was there as you all were reviewing the course before it opened. And one thing that stood out was a conversation the two of you had around Muirfield, the course that is so important to you and your family. They had done some questions of members about which hole was the most favorite hole. The 18 holes got a vote of some number by members. And your response, Jack, to the ones that didn't get a vote was? There's holes to go work on. Yeah. After the first year at Muirfield Village, I asked the membership, what was their favorite hole? I got 14 responses. So there were four holes that weren't mentioned. That just meant to me I had four holes to go work on. To establish them one day to become favorites for someone. That's right. Today at Muirfield Village, I would have pretty much every hole be somebody's favorite hole. That's a really neat business lesson as well, right? That in our job, we should be looking to try to make sure that we're touching all the folks who are our customers and trying to figure out how to make sure that we're in touch with each one of them and doing the polling and other things. That's a really neat touch. Well, they asked me, what's the signature hole on the golf course? (laughs) And I sort of laugh. I said, you didn't hire me to do a signature hole. You hired me to do 18 signature holes. (laughs) That's what I tried to do. Set a really high bar for yourself. Yep. You know, Jackie, you started this book project to honor the lessons you learned by having the best seat in the house as your father's life played out. Yeah. And the book is structured around the number 18. It happens to be the number of majors your father won and the number of holes in a golf course and the number of golden lessons you noted that you had picked up from your father. I know there are many, but you narrowed it down to 18 for the writing of this book. Is there one lesson that we might not have already touched on that stood out that you would share with us that you took from your father that is something you've resonated, you've used to reach back and work with your own children? Well, I think um, there's 18 probably because you hit me over the head and said, Jack, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you so helped me organize a lot of words that I put on paper. So thank you so much for that. And you talk about one particular lesson. Guys, you know, Don, I keep going back to being present. Mm. Mom and dad were always present for us. I watch mom and dad with their grandkids. They don't miss a sporting event. They're always there. And they're not just there, they're dialed in. They're always there. And I, as a parent, the effort that they have made, you don't understand it as a kid, but it's not so easy when you're trying to balance, you know, home and work and then go try to watch a sporting event and not miss something that's important in your kid's life. I so appreciate that more so today as a parent than I did when I was a kid or I'm still a kid. (laughs) We all want to be kids. But I try to do the same thing with my kids, a father-son relationship and even father-daughter relationship. It's just such an incredible relationship to cherish. And, you know, dad mentioned we were on the West Coast of Florida. We were in Maple Sporter looking at two golf course projects there yesterday. We're with a gentleman from Michigan. Of course, dad's from Ohio State, and dad has always uh, revered both Woody Hayes and Bo Schembechler. Oh, we, Woody loved my dad and me. Yeah. My dad was dying from pancreatic cancer, and the last dinner that we had together was Christmas 1969. And that night, knock on the door was Woody Hayes. He was a customer in my dad's drugstore, and Woody came in, and there he said, the, the best father-son relationship that I've ever known. and sort of, you know, made me cry and my dad and, uh, you know, Woody Hayes started at Ohio State with a $25,000 salary. When he finished coaching at Ohio State, he was making $25,000. Never took a raise. Money all went back into the program, always for the kids, never anything about Woody. Same house. He moved to Ohio State and when he left, same house. When Barb's mother passed away, Woody had had a stroke. And he came up to the funeral home. We were in the funeral home when he was in there with the boys. And Ann Hayes, his wife, called and says, Barbara, is Woody up there? He says, yeah. He says, does he have a driver with him? No. He's not supposed to drive a car. He had a stroke. No. Does he have his walker with him? No. But he's not supposed to walk without a walker. And he had the boys cornered over in the room talking about patent and military strategy and history. He loved Patton. He loved war stories. Woody was a great friend and a great man. We all have our shortcomings, and I'm sure Woody had his too. But he was a great teacher. So we learned a lot from Woody, and it was a great influence on my career. He's what actually got me to stop playing football. 
there's such a great generational story there because obviously he saw something special between your father and you, Jack, through this book and able to share the beautiful relationship. I, I have to tell you, I love the admiration, Jackie, you have for your father. I love the way you've taken what you've admired in him, tried to pass it on. And I'm looking forward to the continued teaching of these lessons. Gentlemen, my complete honor to have been able to ask you a few questions today and for this very short period to be your teammate. I look forward to all the amazing things that are coming ahead. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Don. Take care. Best Seat in the House is available now. For the first time, you are given the opportunity to see off-the-course successes, including how Jack and his wife, Barbara, fashioned 50-plus years of marriage, understanding that they both had to give of themselves at least 95% of the time. The importance of having boundaries and limits that everyone in the family agrees on. How Nicholas taught his son, Jack, who worked as his caddy for several years, to value his competitors and treat them as he would hope to be treated. And the need to be connected to what will leave behind our true legacy, our families. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager who did that, uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K, how you doing? Hey Don, how you doing my man? Great, sir. How what they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399. But for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.